This is IAQ Radio, indoor air quality radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. It's episode 693, and this week we welcome Tom Lickers, Senior Vice President, Regulatory Business Practice at First On Site, and the board president for the American Biorecovery Association. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. And don't forget, after the show, we've got afterthoughts.iaqradio.com, sponsored by First On Site. IAQ Radio marquee sponsor is First On Site at firstonsite.com. IAQ Radio Association sponsors are ACGIH, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at acgih.org, AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association at AIHA.org, IICRC, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at IICRC.org, the Restoration Industry Association, RIA, at RestorationIndustry.org, the Environmental Information Association, EIA, at EIA-USA.org. IAQ Radio industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories at AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus at ParticlesPlus.com. TSI Inc. at TSI.com. Tramex Meters at TramexMeters.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine at HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry to report that there were no correct answers to last Last week's IAQ radio trivia question, which was to identify the IICRC chairman when the IICRC's first standard was ANSI approved. The IAQ radio trivia question for today, March 10, 2023, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for the monitoring of indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Here's today's IAQ radio trivia question. Identify where in the continent of North America were biological weapons first used during warfare. Back to you, Joe. All right. Tom Licker is our senior vice president of regulatory business practice at First On Site. He specializes in environmental biorecovery and infection control services. He's also the board president for the American Biorecovery Association in Washington, D.C. He's got over 25 years of professional experience, including managing investigation and remediation of industrial, commercial, and residential properties, and his degrees from Slippery Rock University in environmental sciences. Welcome, Tom. Great to hear you. Great to talk to you. Well, thanks so much for having me, guys. Uh, I think this is uh, this is uh, what we have to talk about is definitely going to be uh, interesting uh and, uh, you know, kind of important for the restoration and the consulting industry alike. Um, so let's let's start with your current position here. Um, regulatory business practice at first on site. I think you, you're working with what Tom Peter and um, maybe a few others on that. That's kind of a big, big ball you're putting together there. You got a bunch of different companies coming together under one new name. Uh, tell us a little bit about the the, you know what you're doing there well we're really excited about the uh, regulatory business practice uh, so it's a combination of environmental services uh, bio recovery asbestos uh, air duct cleaning um, and uh, healthcare. care um, so we have multiple verticals uh, that are usually really heavily re- regulated uh, industries and how do we how do we get that across the entire country or right now across across North America with a consistent level of service and expertise that our clients can can draw on. And that's probably, you know, one of the reasons why we put 
these uh, this regulatory business practice together uh, is to assist in in developing that and and uh, education uh, educating our employees, uh, general managers, and sales staff of how to pursue those markets and how to do the work right. Your area of expertise is um, kind of diverse, but I know recently you've been focused more on like the bio recovery stuff and the, the American Bio Recovery Association. And I always like to start with the foundational questions like what is bio recovery? How does ABRA define bio recovery, Tom? Well, you know, that's a it's a kind of a convoluted thing to think about because what can we be exposed to when we're responding to crime scenes or in events that somebody has a microbial loss or an outbreak uh, or even dealing with drugs and other things that you can run into on a crime scene. So the how do we how we combine that? And because when we look at the big picture uh, of that industry, the exposures to employees or third parties or what have you can be vast. Uh, you're, you could be dealing with a multiple different, different multiple multitude of different exposure risks associated with chemical or biological uh, agents on any of these sites. So how Abra came up with a definition is a biocovery is the act of assessing risk, mitigating threats and remediating conditions resulting from the release of biological hazards. This may include crime and trauma mitigation, bloodborne body fluids, suicide cleanup, um, outbreak response, uh, zoonotic diseases, foodborne diseases, public health threats, illicit drugs, and you know a lot of us uh, help uh, mitigate uh, and remediate clandestine drug labs. So it's you know it's, crime scene is a, is, a, is is could be labeled as a, a multitude of different things. I know when I was with uh, Roy F. Weston, you know, you know, some of these illegal dumping sites are considered crime scenes. So uh, it could be, a, you know, it could be a multitude of things and multiple, multiple variables. You know, when we talked earlier in the week, and you've been doing this for quite a while now, but you, you, you've been on all kinds of sites and recognized a lot of different, you know, chemical and biological hazards. What's your biggest fear today for the industry? Right now, probably the drug fentanyl. Um, and so th this is being pumped in by the Mexican cartels. Uh, it's that extra level of high beyond heroin or morphine. And it's it, right now, just regular fentanyl is a hundred times more powerful than morphine. So why it's being pumped in and, and why it's being combined with so many different drugs right now i mean we're looking at uh, you know it's in cocaine it could we you know, a, a store uh over in philadelphia just got uh, nailed for having uh contaminated gummies um and it's cheap to make um i don't know why anybody would want to stick this in their veins or consume this product at all it's beyond me but it's also becoming one of the leading environmental hazards uh, when we're approaching crime scenes. So yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a tough thing to deal with, especially if you have an unattended death scene or an OD and you're walking into that site for the first time. Uh, it can, you know, it can be, uh, it can end up being deadly. Well, you know, a lot of times the first people to discover this are friends, family of the victim. What yeah. kind of, um, precautions would you ask them or, or, or tell them they should take when they're dealing with something like an overdose or yeah. uh, I guess more commonly an overdose with fentanyl? Yeah. I mean, if you know a family member that's a known drug user um, and you're not, you, you're, you're not educated on, you know, the proper precautions or PPE to wear when you're going into where they were living it's always best to, to get a first responder uh, that knows this to come with you. And a lot of in a lot of cases, we're getting these uh, calls from wellness checks. Uh, same thing with you know when you're when you're dealing with unattended death or uh, suicide. And hey, I haven't heard from Uncle Pete in a while. 
uh, maybe I should call the local PD and, you know, have them check on, check on him and make sure he's all right. And there, there ended up, you know, finding these people uh, OD'd and, and they could have, they could be dead for, you know, 10, 15 days uh, in some of these uh, areas and, and no one would ever know uh, until they start smelling it. Um, so it can be, uh, uh, it can be very dangerous to go into these uh, facilities or, or, homes where they're living uh, and the exposure risks is, is quite high. Well, um, I, I just read an article not long ago about a woman who someone in her family was missing for quite a while. I want to say a month and she found them in a closet. I, I guess find it kind of hard to believe that that odor hadn't gotten just beyond uh, obnoxious, in less than a month. How long does it take before you start to get that bad odor from a body after someone's died or suicide? Oh, yeah, it can be decomposition usually happens and the odor starts coming within 24 to 48 hours or even sooner than that. Um, uh, the, what we're finding is, is that, you know, especially even hoarders, um, they become sensitized to certain things and, uh, they just don't smell it. But when you walk in there, it's like, wow, it hits you right in the face. Uh, and it's, it's one of those order odors that you can, you don't forget about. Um, and, uh, you know, with that said, uh, people just become sensitized to it if, if they're living in a building or whatever. But, you know, when you open that door or you see uh, insect activity on the inside, you know that there's something severely wrong. Uh, has occurred in that in that facility cliff let me turn it over to you it's not just insects it's you know typically it's going to be flies yeah um you know as opposed to other insects and i've had a couple of those well more than a couple over over the course of uh of my experience but one i guess one question that i have when you go into these sites and you're not sure what's there do you use any type of equipment and to try to determine what's there i mean do you, they have gas meters they have um other types of equipment you know the the you know, sensodyne and drager kits you know with the tubes and so on and so forth by which you can kind of uh roll things in or roll things out you know what do you do when you don't know what's there i mean they do make uh kits for uh, detecting fentanyl and and meth and the other things that are relatively quick acting. Uh, it's just going to tell you whether it's there or not. Um, so that's always wise to, to have something like that. But as far as what's there, as far as uh, any type of uh, infectious agent, uh, we're not going to know. Um, and especially on the front of these, when you're doing your initial scope, uh, you're not really going to know what's there. So you have to assume, you know, what does Haswalker teach us? Assume the worst and downgrade from, from there with right, right, right. intelligence and you've done your, your risk assessment. Um, so, you know, with that said, ABRA, the American Bio Recovery Association uh, in 2016, when this, you know, this fentanyl drug and, and other things started coming out, um, we, we started the BISRA a guidance document uh, and it's available for free on the American biorecovery.org website uh, under education guidelines and standards. And it takes the, it, you know, it takes the helps the contractor or people making an entry determine what type of scope is necessary. We borrowed a lot of this from ICRA, which is an infection control risk assessment from hospitals. Mm -hmm. And we put a matrix together uh, that helps the contractor understand the risks, identify the risks, the type of pathogens, uh, type, of, type of drug risk present, and build a scope of work and PPE recommendations from that. So it's been, it's, it's, it has paid for itself 10 times over uh, from the effort that it put, it, it took to put together. Um, I think it, it helps, up, it helps contractors or consultants or whoever's utilizing it uh, make the right, make, make some choice decisions before they're going into some of these properties. What did you call that? BISRA? BSRA. Yeah. Biorecovery mm -hmm. Site Risk Assessment. 
during our talk, Tom, you told me about a situation in Philadelphia, uh, fentanyl related overdose situation. Can you talk to our audience? Give them, I thought it was really good illustration of the dangers of dealing with this drug. Sure. Um, not probably about a month ago, we had a call, um, and, uh, there was a, a condition where the first responders pulled out a unattended uh, death uh, related overdose um, or an overdose related unattended death. Get the, get the sentence straight. Um, and, you know, they pulled him out and once the first responders leave, they just kind of leave the apartment, you know, to, uh, to uh, you know, the, you know, their, their job is done. They got the body out. You know, it's not their job to remediate or, or worry about the conditions on site. So it was kind of left, you know, open. And, uh, about three days later, we had a roommate come back, uh, and they found him un, uh, unresponsive, uh, and had, uh, OD'd, uh, as well. Uh, and then the tenants decided to hire a cleaning company from down the street to clean out the apartment um, afterwards. And the, from what I know, the gentleman went up to scope the job uh, and his wife was down in the car waiting for him and he didn't come back down. Um, so that's how powerful uh, fentanyl can be uh, if you... Uh, touch any of your soft tissues with the drug. It can be absorbed rapidly. Um, and now they're putting uh, even a more dangerous uh, analog of it, uh, carfentanil and other uh, drugs that, you know, I mean, carfentanil is used as an elephant tranquilizer. And very minute amounts of that can cause an OD in a full-grown man. Uh, so... Well, yeah. what's the theory? I mean, did they think that maybe the the roommate went in and touched something and then touched their eyes? Or yeah, they, I don't, I don't, yeah. So, inhalation. It wouldn't seem like it'd be an inhalation thing. It's probably some kind of ingestion. Yeah, it's a cocaine. Uh, it, you know, from what I know, what I, from what I know of the uh, of the situation, it was put in cocaine. Uh, and this isn't our first one. We had another one in a school, not uh, not too far from here, where it was a teacher that uh, decided to do some uh, cocaine in his uh, in his room and uh, he had succumbed um, or didn't succumb but it took him took the first responders three shots of narcan uh, to get him revived um, so you know with that said this stuff is really really dangerous um, I mean you can get on your hands and wash it off with soap and water and one of the things I wanted to read or you know talk about during this segment is that never ever use alcohol sanit uh, hand sanitizer when dealing with any type of drug, uh, fentanyl in, in particular, because it'll just go right into your skin. Um, so, so you want soap and water typically? Soap and water only. Uh, oh. If you get it on your skin and get it on your hands, uh, you're always using soap and water on your exterior PPE uh, to. Uh, uh, you know, get it off. Um, so, you know, with that said, there are people that are trained to be able to do, to, to enter into these, uh, situations and, uh, it's a, uh, it's best left to the professionals. So understood Tom. Dave, we've got this website up now yeah. and, and you've mentioned that BSRA where we'd find that under, um, education, education. There you go. Okay. Guidelines and standards. Scroll down. There you go. Click on, click on guidelines and standards. Okay. You'll scroll down. You'll see ABRA bio recovery site risk assessment. And that's a document that uh, we're utilizing. Beautiful. It was developed by our, our technical uh, group. Um, and uh, so it takes you through all the, the typical uh, upfront information, uh, the intelligence gathering, uh, what type of, of biosafety risk are you dealing with? Is it a group one, group two, group three, group four agent? Um, and, uh, you know, how, how are we going to eventually put something together for the scope uh, and 
get the job started and to get it completed so we can return those properties back to livable condition. And one of the things that we're having trouble with guys is, is finding IEPs uh, to do the upfront extent of the contamination sampling and do the clearance reports. It's a lot of liability uh, to consider, uh, but if the, if the cleanup has been done properly, uh, you know, ch chances are that if a, if a good clearance sampling protocol has, has, been, has taken place, that you can safely return those uh, those properties back. Now we've done some clan lab. We've seen some clan labs, clandestine drug labs, uh, that's where they have pill press operations in the kitchen. They're using the garage as a decon chamber, uh, and there's one that was pretty close to here that they put enough fentanyl through to, for forty thousand ODs, um, and that was a big bust up in New York. We have police cars that are just sitting because they're contaminated with fentanyl. Some of them are brand new. So this is becoming a, uh, an economic, uh, just self, you know, it's, it's destruction, economic destruction. Um, and it doesn't know any demographic. It could be very wealthy people that get hooked I mean, back in the 90s, you guys remember when we had pain clinics uh, popping up everywhere like a Starbucks. Um, and these doctors were just prescribing. There were lines of people waiting to get their Oxycontin. Right. But when the government shut them down, where did they go? They went to the street and are getting they don't know what they're getting in the mix. OK, it's just going to be that next level high. A lot of these people's lives have been destroyed. Um. So it's a, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of empathy that goes in uh, to this as well, because they didn't intend to be there. They didn't intend to get to this level. Um, and, you know, you, you feel sorry for them, but at the same time, you know, they made that choice to go down that road. Um, and it is, it, it is a, a difficult thing to see. I was just in Seattle, Washington, and you could see the, the you know, the, the houseless or homeless camps uh, with the tents everywhere. Um, and that's, the, you know, you go into those those areas and you can see tabs of all sorts of different narcotics and needles and what have you. As a matter of fact, one of the ABRA members makes a majority of his revenue by doing needle sweeps and cleaning up the, you know, these camps. Um, so. <laughs> You know, with that said, yeah, we have a we have a serious problem uh, in this country regarding this, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. I never but, thought about that being a, a way to actually, you know, get some income going around and cleaning up after that. That's interesting. Cliff, let me turn it over to you. Yeah, chemically, um, what can you tell us about uh, fentanyl and, and methamphetamine? Um, it seems, you know, are they water soluble? Uh, you know, if they are, then, you know, soap and water and, and things like that. Uh, what about oxidizers? W would oxidizers, you know, bleaches, peroxide, parasitic acid, uh, things like that that are known to um, oxidize, uh, you know, would, would they play a role in, in the cleanup? And then if so, how do you deal with the collateral damage that, some of these oxidizers are going to cause. Oh, absolutely. We're, I'm working uh, right now with DevCom, uh, right. um, okay. talking to the, their folks, and they're actually using a high concentration uh, parasitic hydro hydroxyl radical gas in order to deactivate okay. the drug. Um, but the white paper in the study hasn't been finished yet. Uh, typically, when we're doing these types of decontaminations, we're using a combination of uh, py uh, pyracetic acid, hydrogen peroxide, surfactant. Um, and uh, that seems to be the go-to. Uh, it was that same product was used to decon the heart building, uh, down for anthrax, um, and it was typically 
uh, put out the market, uh, you know, but it's very harsh. Um, it simply put out the market, uh, you know, when we had the anthrax scares um, and a lot of first uh, first responding companies or first responder uh, organizations are targeted uh, for this product. And most of them have it on their shelf just in case. Um, but does it, uh, can it ruin finishes? Can it ruin, uh, furniture? Can it, yeah, but in typical, typically we're getting rid of anything that's going to be porous or sealing anything, um, in order to, you know, help mitigate, uh, any of that. But with that said, this is, these can be some of the most difficult cleanups that, uh, if you, especially you have a combo bio and drug, uh, Event. You, you know, go, going back to anthrax, I think anthrax um, in some ways might be easier easier to approach because you, you need something that's foresightal in order in order to deal with it. Right. With and you know, there are different things you know, such as the oxidizers. But you know, if you could get a permit, you could also go back to using things like formaldehyde and so on and so forth. You know, that are known to be sporocidal and you're not going to have the collateral damage. But, you know, when you have, you know, fentanyl and some of these other things, um, you're not trying to kill anything. You're trying to decontaminate or neutralize, you know, the chemistry. And that's where you don't have, you know, so some of the other things wouldn't, you know, be useful there. The work that we, the word that we like to use is deactivate. Um, that's, and there's, there are a couple of products that are currently get marketed primarily to first responders in the military regarding uh, <laughs> this, uh, the clandestine drugs. Um, so, and like I said before, a lot of them are pyracetic acid peroxide based surfactants, uh, three part mixes, uh, and uh, they can be very harsh. Uh, but when you need to fight fire with fire, that's what you need. Right. No, understood. So on, on our last show, I think the last show or maybe two shows ago, we we had um, we had Connie Arabs on, and and we were talking about the hydroxyl generators and the use of hydroxyl generators on restoration projects. How are they used? I noticed you mentioned hydroxyls, but I don't know in what form you're using these hydroxyls. How are they used for this bio recovery work? Well, you know, in general, uh, you know, hydroxyls are nature's scrubbing material uh, and, you know, they're generated after a lightning storm. Uh, so, you know, with that said, there are products that used ionized hydrogen peroxide and, you know, it's not necessarily like a hydroxyl generator um, that is typically, you know, typically, you know, used in, in comparison with ozone. Um, so this is a uh, ionized hydrogen peroxide or IHP uh, has a wide variety of uses. And, and initially the technology uh, was created by DARPA um, and for the Department of Defense. Uh, and the, so as this, uh, you know, hydroxyls are generated from the peroxide solution they're negatively charged so they kind of like repel each other and move throughout a space by themselves and then attach to positively charged surfaces and neutralize that product upon contact. Um, so it, it, will, will this be Steramist or something like that? Yes. I didn't yeah, want okay. to mention the brand name. No, no, that's, that's, no, no, that, that's right. okay. Cause I think, I think the people will understand and that's the reason I interjected it, you know, because what's coming out, out of, uh, your application equipment is a droplet, you know, wet droplet. Yeah. Or, and it's different than, um, you know, putting in a hydroxyl generator like some of these people do after fires and so on and so forth. And Right. It's a, it's a totally different process than that. Um, do you ever uh, use those right, hydroxyl generators? The government and DARPA and so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, we'll use the hydroxyl generators primarily for odor control. Um, but we don't really look to them as a, for purposes of having any, uh, efficacy for disinfection or deactivation of any chemical agent. Um, what about biological? Uh, no, I, I don't look to, uh, like I said, I only use them for odor control, uh, only, um, 
you know, the efficacy of it is, you know, the, most of those are, don't have any EPA registration for uh, disinfection uh, or deactivation of, of any product. Um, so they do have their limitations. Uh, and that's why we kind of looked at something that does have that EPA registration uh, for the, you know, for claimed efficacy. Now, you, you guys are, you know, your regulatory and business practice, I assume you're kind of like overseeing a lot of different organizations that were brought together as a part of the first on-site family. Yeah. And I'm sure some of them use these hydroxyl generators on, you know, water damage and fire and so on and so forth. Does the company have a position on whether or not your employees are allowed to be in an area where they're actively using these hydroxyl generators? Um, typically, it's, it's, you know, it's not a uh, something that we would encourage. Uh, that's for sure. Um, you know, any exposures to, uh, especially when we're using something like Steramist uh, in an enclosed space, where you've got to, you, you know, you have to have the proper PPE on. Um, and that's what we encourage. We always encourage safety first. Make sure you got, uh, uh, you know, your carbon cartridges uh, with, your, with your HEPA filters in order to uh, uh, get that, uh, you know, taken care of so you're not breathing, you know, those hydroxyls in. Um, Are you using a full face or a half face? Or uh, we'll use we'll use full face. Uh, okay, you know that's uh, because you know you don't want that you know irritating your soft tissues either, um, and it will um, it will definitely irritate your soft tissues. Okay. Uh, so you know, with that said, it's always you know we always take the position of safety first, uh, and uh, you know try and you know encourage our our employees to do the right thing. John, let's go to halftime, buddy. Our marquee sponsor is First On Site, your trusted full-service disaster recovery and property restoration company at firstonsite.com. Our association sponsors are ACGIH, advancing careers of professionals in environmental health, industrial hygiene, and safety, interested in defining their science. ACGIH.org. AIHA, healthy workplaces, a healthier world. AIHA.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry. IICRC. CRC.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, free shipping, great pricing, same day results with no rush fee, AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus, feature rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us, ParticlesPlus.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations, TSI.com. Tramex Meters, developing modern dynamic moisture meters and humidity monitoring systems since 1974. TramexMeters.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers, HealthyIndoors.com. All right, we're back with the second half of our interview. We got Tom Licker from First On Site and Abra. Tom, I, I'm wondering if we could maybe go through a typical project where you've got to go in. Let's say it's a, I don't know. Let's say it's a suicide situation, or it's an OD, and you're not sure whether or not there's fentanyl present. Um, and I'm I'm just curious, what are the typical cleanup methods are you are you HEPA vacuuming, wet wiping, are you removing it sounds like you remove most if not all of the porous materials maybe you could just kind of go down the the typical steps for our audience yeah sure uh, that's not a problem well in general when you're doing any type of crime and trauma where you got uh, blood and body fluids present you always want to do your risk assessment and, for, and get that all the information and the intelligence gathering on the front end so at least you know what you what you're expecting and what your crew is going to be uh, expecting going to that job uh, in most things, you know, we sign off on a JSA, uh, job safety analysis, uh, and we sign off on the BISRA. Um, so, the, the, you know, they also read the BISRA, so they know exactly what steps in the scopes are going to be in the scope that are going to be expected of them. Um, so, stop, stop. Who's them? Uh, sorry, the crew. Uh, okay, the, okay. The, the crew that's going to be performing the work. Got it. So and in the general, is what we put up earlier, the yeah. what's yeah. that 
for again? Fire recovery site risk assessment. All right, thank you. Um, so then, you know, if we if we're approaching a job and we have an unattended death scene, you know, not only do you have to worry about uh, because the primary thing and the trigger for any type of issues sometimes with re-victimization or reoccupancy of the space are residual odors from a decomp. Um, and that's one of our primary worries uh, in leaving anything you know on the job. Insect activity, larval stuff, especially with flies, maggots, and stuff like that, they have a tendency to, to as the body's decomposing, uh, they will carry contaminants with them. And whether they're in the walls or what have you, and some of this, you know, we've seen some jobs that where you have a 30 day decomp and the, you know, the larval and insect, insect activity on site is extensive. Uh, and you're trying to, to justify removing X, Y, you know, Z, uh, porous contents or, or structural material to an adjuster. And they're like, no way, you know. And so it is a uh, uh, oftentimes we are educating uh, our, you know, the reasons and, and, and making sure that the, we are we justify everything that we do in order to bring that property whole. Now, the first thing, first steps that we do you know, we'll, you know, of course, doff or don our, our proper PPE going into the, into the site. We then will then address cleaning up to uh, the path of extraction or uh, cleaning, you know, where they, the, the corner may have uh, removed the body or other types of, of things. And we'll, we'll clean up to the gross, gross contamination. Then we'll address the gross contamination, uh, and, and clean that up and make sure that the, and then uh, in, the, in the process, you're finished with your gross contamination cleaning. So if anybody does go in there, they don't visually uh, get re-victimized or if they have weak stomachs, we're not creating another biohazard, if you know what I mean. So Okay, okay stop. So when we're doing this cleaning, what sort of method would you use? Would you use, you know, uh, it seems that something like foam might have some advantages, like a foaming cleaning agent or something like that might be superior to, I mean, we're not going to be HEPA vacuuming. Uh, solids, no. Solids, right. No, so, but, right. you know, yeah. if, the, if the blood is dry right. uh, and the first responders have disturbed it, you can aerosolize it. And that can, right. in the HVAC system, potentially right. what have you. Um, so after we're done, you know, cleaning up the gross contaminants, we'll often apply an enzyme uh, yes. that will, you know, start to eat away at, and, and enzyme cleaners are fantastic mm -hmm. for cleaning up proteins like this. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll follow, there's, there's even uh, done some work uh, with uh, a, a product that contains a non-pathogenic spore bacterial right. spore right. that can also just if you if you're cautious and you don't kill the kill the spore um right. it'll go into some of the porous materials and start eating away at the proteins as well right. so there's there's some and that's new that's something that has come up in our in our industry on occasion where man you just cannot get access to this area of the building where these contaminants are and how do we address that um so there are some, you know, some tricks to the trade of what we use and uh, how, you know, how we uh, address those issues uh, in order to mitigate them properly. Because, again, you, the, you don't want to be uh, re-victimized, re-victimizing people with odors or if they go into a uh, an area and, you know, during a renovation and they find a big you know, uh, black spot somewhere. And they're like, you're like, what is that? Um, so it's a, uh, you know, it's a tough job. It's probably one of the harder jobs to, to mitigate, uh, you know, versus your, your, uh, your mold remediation or other types of, uh, uh of your straightforward, you know, scope here it is, try and find it because when you have uh, unattended death or anything, the, the, the body fluids can follow a wide variety of paths, 
you know, similar to water. Uh, I mean, our bodies are, are you know, 98% water. So right. uh, where's it going to go? Um, right. A lot of things to think about, a lot of variables. I mean, as a recovering chemical manufacturer, <laughs> I, I can tell you that a lot of a lot of the products that are sold as enzyme en enzyme products or bioenzymatic products and so on and so forth are exactly as you said. Uh, they are a non pathogenic uh, bacillus species and so yep. on and so forth. But you couldn't go in. I, the, the chemical manufacturer didn't necessarily want to tell you that there were, you know, billions of spore forming bacteria in every ounce, you know, yeah. and you're going to tell your customer that. So, you know, they kind of you know, create the term bioenzymatic and, 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 right. and, they, and they kind of, uh, they kind so of, so yeah, they kind of dull it down. Right. Um, no, so but you can't, you can't get enzymes. I mean, there's certainly, they're available and there, there are enzymes that are very, very uh, effective on, on, on protein and so on and so forth. Some of them you have to be careful with because, and you know, some are known, particularly in dry form, to be sensitizers uh, to workers and stuff like that. Well, that's you know that's why we always have that final disinfection phase of every product where we're using. Uh, in, in that case, we would probably use a sporicide, you know, such as uh, steramist, in order to uh, you know mitigate the the you know any residual stuff uh, from what we've applied. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Tom, um, I got two questions. Then I got a couple text questions I need to get to. One is, okay, you mentioned Steramist. Are there, for those that don't have the money or aren't licensed to use the Steramist, are there equivalent type products that they can use? Um, not at that level. I don't believe so. So when you're dealing with Steramist, you're dealing with a, of course, a more of a, of a vapor phase uh, or uh, uh, gas phase product. Um, you know, there's, there's other spore size that you can use as a general cleaner. Um, but you have to watch your, you know, the, you know, the wet deactivation time or the dwell time. Um, I mean, a lot of people are using some of these oxidizers and not realizing that you have to leave that surface wet for 10 minutes in order to achieve the advertised efficacy. Um, you have to use enough moisture to keep it wet for 10 minutes. Exactly. And who does that? Nobody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we just have to be careful, make sure we read, we read the label, the EPA registered label of how to apply that product and how to do things correctly. Um, you know, other than that, the, then, the, you know, everything falls back on the applicator uh, and that's the contractor. I got a text from the audience that says, can you provide some insight on how illicit drug debris is disposed? Is this considered regulated waste? Great question. That's a great question because uh, uh, it's not considered a hazardous waste yet. Okay. Uh, there's been rumors that the, uh, they, that it's, they're going to try, you know, start listing some of this. I mean, they list warfarin uh, as a RICRA uh, waste stream. Um, but in general, anything that's uh, that's considered uh, fentanyl contaminated or, uh, you know, of that nature, we will send off as overclassified medical waste um, and have it incinerated. The that's that's the current process right now. And is this double bagged like you do with asbestos or how do you, same, how do you package it? Same methodology as we do our medical waste. So we have a, you know, a good uh, a contractor bag. Then we have the uh, red bag uh, and it's double bagged and, you know, contained in uh, either boxes uh, or we have uh, um, large uh, drums, uh, you know, 35 gallon, 55 gallon poly open tops uh, that we will, we will put the bag material in and send it off as overclassified medical waste. Okay, uh, wait, wait one second. Okay, no, no, no. This is this is important. I think people are going to learn from his answer this question. You know, uh, it, it seems that you know most people that die at home die in a pretty predictable place. You know, a lot of them end up succumbing uh, in their bed, in their mattress. So we have a mattress, we have a box spring, and you know, at some point they're going to be 
uh, body fluids and certain other situations, there's going to be blood and so, and so on and so forth. How do we deal with those mattresses? Okay, uh, can can you pick out the? Yeah, you know, can you separate the? Uh, you know, what do we do with the metal, for instance? You know, can we disassemble it? You, you know, you got to be careful that you don't get cotton. Uh, what, it, how do you it, deal with mattresses? It's uh, mattresses or furniture. Right. Couches, yeah. Couches, yeah. anything along those lines. Right. Recliners. We will, we will we will strip that that those things down to the springs. Got it. And yeah, then we will, you know, decon the springs. You know, the springs or any hard surface uh right. and dispose of it accordingly. Um the you know, beds and bedding like that, all the uh you know any type of blankets the stuff right all the stuff that goes off as medical waste medical. no understood. So, understood yeah so anything porous uh our law states in new jersey that you know anything porous has to go off as that soaked in blood or body fluids goes right. as waste. medical waste so, so is a drywall porous is um yes. yeah, you know wood. structural lumber porous yep yep, yep. yep. okay yep. interesting all right i've got another great text question here as a home inspector i sometimes get realtor investors booking us into unknown circumstance homes what do i look for in terms of hidden drug contamination and can i do a simple spot sampling to determine a full-blown assessment is necessary that's a tough one i um, thought it might be <laughs> yeah, <laughs> question. Um, if i if i'm a home inspector and i'm going into because a lot of these people won't tell you what happened at that job site. They won't tell you what happened in that home. Uh, and if you're going into especially a sketchy area, um, uh, you know, use your best judgment uh, in order to go in there and do those inspections. Uh, you know, you can go in there and you can buy that, the, buy those fentanyl kits, uh, those test strips and, and try it yourself. Uh, if it, you do what makes you feel comfortable, um, you know, that's it, you, the, some of these are, are very difficult to even detect. We're finding fentanyl traces on tops of ceiling fans, anywhere there's static and dust. Uh, you know, the HVAC system, the coils where you have, uh, you know, air moving, uh, backs of televisions. They're finding this stuff, uh, especially if they're using the pills and they're crushing the pills in the space uh, because they're aerosolizing the product. Um, so, you know, with that said, I, I this is very scary. Uh, and uh, but if you take the proper precautions of PPE coming going into these sites and a lot of times, you know, what I'm worried about is. If we go into a job, uh, a site for water damage uh, or a fire, and all of a sudden you see drug paraphernalia all over the place, uh, you know what to, you know what decisions do you have to make in order to protect yourself and your employees? Uh, you know, a lot of times we want to get a CIH in there uh, immediately to evaluate uh, for our purposes because we could be disturbing or aerosolizing these, these products uh, as we're doing our work. I, I would imagine, um, is it, is there another way you could look at that maybe and, and look, do like a literature search or do a Google search of some kind to look and see, you know, maybe there was a, an article in a newspaper that someone was shot in that home or there was a suicide or there was an overdose, or is there maybe a, some kind of government uh, list that, kind of keeps track of these things. And, and and then beyond that, there's a text saying regarding the trauma industry and knowing the dangers of the work, why have more states not required licensing for contractors like Georgia? Well, it's, it's you know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, we've tried to uh, uh, push for licensing uh, in you know, Georgia, California, uh, have California has a trauma scene practitioners licensing, but it, you know, it doesn't require anybody to get educated or anything, but other than handling medical waste. Um, and, you know, that's where a third party credentialing body like Abra uh, can help you know, differentiate between the people that uh, went and got a bloodborne pathogen card and, and think that they're, uh, that all of a sudden they're an industry player. Um what was your first question again, Joe? What, well, so, you know, with the, 
home inspector being worried about what happened in that home prior to them getting there? Is there some way of going? Like, I, I mean, I guess I would do a Google search and see if anybody had, but, you know, if there'd been any crime scene there or if there had been some kind of a suicide or, the, you know, I would imagine you could find some of that somewhere, but I really don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, you could do an Oprah request uh, on that property and see what's in there. Uh, but a lot of these times, uh, you know, especially if it's uh, an unattended death and stuff like that, that kind of stuff is... Uh, you know, it kind of just slips under the radar. Uh, we we have had we've had members of our organization go into properties, uh, and one of them they did a decomp in the one room, and they went to the next room because they just wanted the carpet match, and they pulled up and they see the outline of a of a body underneath the carpet um, that was there historically because uh, it wasn't cleaned up properly. So, is it disclosed in real estate? Uh, I haven't seen it. I, I don't I, know. Yeah, I just don't yeah. know. <clears throat> it, is it part of the disclosure? Uh, I haven't seen it. Well, and um, I had a comment here that, you know, it's not just sketchy places, but, you know, very wealthy homes that may have visible drug paraphernalia. So I think yeah, that's a good comment. Never, you never know what you're going to walk into. Um, that's right. And I, I got a quick one here. Do, you, do your workers have Narcan on their trucks? Yes. When yes. you're into any type of buyer recovery project or anything where it's, this is a, a suspect, uh, we have Narcan available. Excellent. Let's go to the roundup, John. All right, we're in the roundup. I want to thank Tramex Meters for joining us. The Restoration Industry Association is a, a returning sponsor. And, of course, the Environmental Information Association. Great to have all three on board. Let's get back to our guest, Tom Licker. Uh, Tom, let's, I want to turn it over to the Z-Man here because I think he's, you know, he's much more experienced in this area than me, and he's got a couple questions I'm sure he hadn't gotten a chance to ask. Go ahead. Okay, well, I, I would say uh, today um, – it's tough to find employees in general. It yeah. would seem that it's hard to find uh, employees to do this in particular. And I'm wondering, um, where do you find them? And, and, you know, how do you ask someone to, you know, to to do what we have to ask these people to do, I guess is probably the easiest Yeah, very, to do very carefully. Um, because you don't want to end up putting anybody who has experience a similar tragedy with their own family where they had to clean it or they thought they had to clean it up themselves right. um, because that can trigger PTSD uh, in a hurry. Um, and it's really hard to find people that are willing to do this. Uh, I mean, even if you pay them more, um, it's, it's hard to find people uh, and it's hard to find good people. That's, you know, trying to, in, the, in this environment right now, our skilled trades are in trouble. Uh, and that's one of the biggest things that uh, is going to hit this, hit this country is, uh, you know, as uh, you know, the older demographic starts to uh, move out, this younger dem demographic coming up isn't really interested in, in doing the dirty jobs. I mean, if I can quote Mike Rowe, um, you know, we, you know, buyer recovery is the dirtiest job, one of the dirtiest jobs out there. Um, and uh, how do we, uh, you know, how do we uh, draw people into this, uh, into this industry? And one of the things that got me eventually hooked on this thing, because initially I wasn't, you know, want any part of this. All right. It was disgusting. Um, you know, give me the pharmaceutical and, and the, the other stuff uh you know the biosafety stuff and the and the standard just decon work the clean decon work right um because it was hard for me to, to even stomach um so how do we get people into this we want people that you know really care about uh, the next of kin or can put themselves you know not in their shoes but understand what the next of kin uh, it, it has to deal with becoming the executor of the property, who the insurance company is, you know, uh, is it going to be a covered loss? 
uh, all these things that you know are questions that we can help uh, that, you know get them you know get them information on or get the get the process started so you know they can recover and the property can recover um, and it really comes down to compassionate uh, people uh, uh, that really want to help people out uh, and deal with some uh, you help them through uh, one of the worst times of their lives now we're not psychiatrists psychologists we're not public adjusters um you know but uh, you know but we can at least help facilitate the process of, of, of at least having that property healed and get in and make sure that we you know do the best we can that they're never re-victimized uh from this uh, you know they never see it again it doesn't you know uh, i know it's tough for a lot of people who have lost a loved one in this in this matter uh uh, to see this stuff on TV uh, and see the conditions that some of these people are living in uh, because it always triggers that it can always trigger a negative response. And, you know, we just do the best we can in this industry to, you know, to provide that platform that, that uh, and a level of trust uh, that people, you know, come to know from, uh, from companies that are involved with the American Bio Recovery Association. Like how do you ensure, how do you ensure payment? You know, because sometimes, there, there might be insurance proceeds, you know, sometimes there's not. Right. Um, how do you insure payment? Yeah, that's, a, that's some of the, sometimes a, one of the tough things in this industry. On, on the front end, uh, you know, you got to say, hey, you know, I, I got to have something, you know, on the front of this in order to facilitate the process going forward. And we'll go in and, and uh, you know, say, well, you know, generally, you know, it, it's going to cost X uh, per day, you know, for a trauma team. And if we cover that, that first front day, um, with a credit card payment or something along those lines, uh, that can at least facilitate the job going forward, uh, and get them under contract. Uh, and then we, we, you know, after we get that first day done, we can evaluate where they are in the process of the claim and, and, and all that kind of uh, stuff and, and understand where any of the, of the future funds, uh, may come from it may come from a from a home equity loan if there's you know if there's equity available in the property um, they could finance it um, in some other uh, way uh, you know why any type of uh, you know claim uh, is is put forth so there's there's methods to the madness um, and it can be complete madness especially if you have a a condo uh, where you have the, you know, the condo owner, the tenants, and then you have the association and you've had contaminants travel from one uh, apartment to another. Um, yeah. It can be, it can be a, a major hurdle to negotiate. Um, so, and it's a tough job. It's a, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the toughest, but at the same time, when I, when I get that hug, at the end of one of these, right, right. it just, it, it, the, it, it comes, it comes, it comes full circle and it, that's the purpose, uh, you know, uh, and uh, I think a lot of people are, are driven to help people uh, in, a, in a tough time uh, and, you know, don't lose focus on that purpose. Tom, you, you mentioned how tough it is for you, your employees, et cetera. How do you minimize the, the psychosocial stress for your cleanup crew members? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, you know, if there, it, you know, if it's something that isn't routine, it's something off the wall, you have to do a debriefing and you may do it with your entire team or you do it one at a time. I always have an open door policy uh, and a lot of, a lot of even, uh, this one thing that the, you know, ABRA membership is so valuable for, for, for me is I can talk to somebody outside of my organization and I could pick up the phone and say, I just need somebody to talk to. And I've done that several times, uh, especially when you have a loss with children involved or other things that, you know, it just, it's, you know, your heart just got ripped out. Um, and you're trying to, you know, refocus and, and understand that your you know it's you, your purpose of uh, rectifying and performing you know performing that that surgery uh, to that property uh, and uh, you know 
you, you've, you've provided a positive outcome uh, for that family. And, it's, you know, it's always, you know, positive reinforcement uh, tools that you can use. And, and if they need to talk to somebody, absolutely, you get them somebody as an employer. Um, you know, because uh, good employees are getting really hard to find right now, as we said, and uh, some of these jobs can be uh, can be quite traumatic to the, the people that are doing the uh, remediation as well. What kind of pay? I mean, do they get extra pay from the typical disaster restoration people? Do you have a, a separate pay scale for these folks? Yeah, we 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 will have a voucher um, for them for doing you know buy recovery work. Um, and, uh, you know, that seems to help uh, the situation. It helps recruit people from, we don't make anybody just, you know, or hire anybody just to do this type of work. Um, you know, it's, you know, we approach other employees within our organization, you know, uh, are you fit for this type of, uh, you know, of work? And, uh, you know, that's something a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of employers don't go out of their way for. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is something that's very unique, um, and it takes the right people. Uh, that's why a lot of people in our industry look to retired first responders, um, mm -hmm. because they've, you know, as for employees, because they've had that, uh, that experience, they've had that training, uh, especially EMTs, uh, they make great employees for this industry. Um, and even, even to have them retain as part-time, uh, employees for this type of work is, is that's how a lot of these crime and trauma companies got started uh, because they were EMTs or they were police officers. Um, and uh, that's, you know, the way that they're trained to talk to people and especially in Mexican or those who've had a tragedy is the, that experience is incredible. Um, it's in very bad way. What about veterans? Do they work well in this? I, you know, they can. Um, I, I've often thought that route, Joe, uh, more probably on the hazmat side than the bio. Uh, some of those guys have seen stuff and seen horrific, absolutely horrific stuff. Um, and would, it, would that pit trigger PST, P, yeah. PST to a wartime incident you know all we're seeing really is the aftermath of a of a uh, you know of someone's tragedy very rarely do we see the bodies um you know some of us actually would will help coroners out in rural areas uh and do extractions but you know with that said i always worry that if i bring a veteran in uh on something like this that that would trigger something back to a wartime incident um and you know i'm sure that the some of them would be absolutely fantastic uh for a position with a company like with ours like that but i, I always uh always uh, word of caution uh you know uh, i've seen everything that's you know i've been involved in war um and uh i'll be okay with this uh but you take your risks in hiring anybody to do this type of work you don't, and a lot of them are not, you know, will not disclose uh, an experience with a tragedy that they've had uh, because they want, of course, they want the job. Um, and that's, that's, that's difficult. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's tough to find, you know, you know, employees that, you know, have that focus or have that mindset. That's for sure. Tom, before we go, is there anything you'd like to add? Or Cliff, is, do you have another question you want to throw in? No, I'm good, Joe. Thank you. Tom, final word for you, buddy. Yeah, I just want to reiterate uh, the fact that uh, of using caution, um, using the buddy system. Uh, and, good one, yeah. You know, making sure that uh, uh, when you go into these types of properties uh, that you do have Narcan available to you. Um, you know, even from the consultant side of things, you don't know. You 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 don't know through these days, um, and and the situation is just getting worse. Uh, it's not getting any better. Um, so you know, with that said, mindset safety first always. Um, make sure that you're updated on uh, your Hazwopper. 
certifications, your bloodborne pathogens at a minimum. Uh, and I always encourage people to take a crime and trauma uh, or uh, infection control course uh, so they understand what, what perils are uh, they were faced with in this industry. Uh, it's just not blood anymore, guys. It, you know, a lot of these guys, well, just go clean it up. It's just blood. I don't know how many times a technician from, you know, other companies out there that uh, will jump at a chance to do is because they see the rates in Xactimate being so high. Um, and they're actually putting their unknowingly or knowingly, negligently putting their employees at risk. Um, and we get those calls every once in a while. You know, my boss just told me to go clean this up. You know, are you trained for that? Um, so, you know, with that said, uh, always err on the side of caution, stay safe. Um, and uh, when, you, when you're safe and you have everything all together, you have all your plans together, uh, it makes this industry a little bit more palatable. Tom Licker, thank you so much for joining us. A uh, very interesting, although a little depressing at times topic. Uh, but, you know, somebody's got to do this stuff. I mean, and and it happens every day out here, multiple times a day. And, uh, you know, we see all these mass shootings now. I can't even imagine what it's like to go in and clean up after something like that. Um, it's got to be a tough job. And thank you for doing it. And thank you for joining us today. I appreciate it, guys. And stay safe. And, uh, uh, have a great St. Patrick's Day weekend. Thank you. That's a big one here in the Berg. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Our thanks to Tom Licker and uh, my co-host, the Z-Man Cliff Zlotnick. John, you got to have faith that the controls of course, our growing audience and um, our, our wonderful sponsors. We couldn't do the show without you. Uh, next week, we're doing a, uh, a memorial show for for Hal Levin, who unfortunately passed recently, an IAQ pioneer. We did two shows with Hal back in 2010. We're going to repackage those, put a YouTube together with some photos we've got from Hal, of Hal. And um, it was a great, great two-part show. We're going to put it all together in one nice package for everyone next week. So come back and join us next Friday at noon for the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.